Cool. Well, thank you guys. Let's start out with the, uh, the, the easy question. Just maybe introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you work on. Uh, sure. So I'm Greg Gazelle, and I run product marketing for our mobile products at Salesforce. I've been at Salesforce for uh, just about 10 years, so I'm kind of an old, old timer at the company. Um, we've had a mobile product for 10 years, actually, so I've gotten to see it come up through the ranks, starting with you know, the big BlackBerry phone. The first one was actually a Palm Trio that nice. could run Salesforce. So it's been around for quite a bit. Um, so really focused on our apps, our app portfolio, and really our whole platform. And I'm uh, Elliot Crom, uh, one of the founders and the CTO at GetAround. Um, I guess uh, only been at GetAround about six and a half, seven years now, so really a noob in comparison. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I guess I was working on the iPhone, was one of the first developers, you could say, on the, uh, on the smartphone, on the iOS platform, because I was working on some of the iPhone hacking before the App Store came out. Mm -hmm. So if you jailbroke your phone before the App Store came out, you probably installed one of my apps or were using one of my software for that. So I've uh, been using... Uh, you know, the, the developer tools for iOS and Android for a really long time now. Cool, great. I actually, I just used Get Around to Go to Yosemite a couple weeks ago, so, uh, so thank you for your work. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, my name is Eric Singley. I head up the consumer product team at Yelp, and I've been there about, about eight years. So we've got some, some real weight here to this panel in, uh, in, in, tech, in tech years. Um, when I first started at Yelp, we didn't have a, a mobile product at all. I, I take that back. We had a we had a WAP site. I don't remember WAP sites. <laughs> they were terrible <laughs> little websites that were designed to run on the uh, state-of-the-art phones at the time, which was like the Motorola Razor. Um, so <laughs> thankfully, those days are behind us. And so we built an iPhone app around 2007, and sort of uh, the rest of, the rest is history. Um, Cool. Well, I thought where I'd start is, you know, in the, in, in the previous talk, uh, a couple of things that were mentioned were around key metrics that are tracked. And, you know, one thing that was called out is when you're looking at key metrics, it's important to not just kind of look at aggregate average data and instead make sure that you segment your data around interesting things. So maybe a couple of questions, you know, for, for each of you. Um, what are some of the key metrics that you look at for your products and um, how are some of the ways that you, you segment that information to make it more kind of interesting? Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, let's see. So GetAround cares about kind of the, 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 we'll start with the basic stuff first, right? We, we add cars to our platform, which means uh, people decide to share their car when they're not using it and just put it on the platform. And that goes through a whole uh, sales funnel. We'll actually reach out to those people and contact them. So there's a whole bunch of metrics that you can track from a, a sales perspective, and that ties directly to the growth of our business. Uh, and then on the renter side, people need a car when, when you know, they don't have a car in the city or want to take a, a Tesla Roadster out for a spin for the first time or, uh, you know, need to go up to Napa or Tahoe for the weekend. They sign up directly on the site and you track kind of the full uh, uh, section of kind of engagement metrics and, and funnel metrics throughout that sign-up process and then uh, how these cohorts work on kind of a... a month-to-month -month basis and you'll see these groups come in at different from different events and things like that and you'll start to segment it by uh, by some of the sales and acquisition data so like these guys came from this channel versus this channel or mm -hmm. uh, things like that cool. yeah for us um, you know for our mobile application you in our mobile platform you get it when you subscribe with Salesforce we have a lot of companies that are subscribers but we're really looking to um, grow our install our user base of the mobile application the mobile platform within our user base so we're, of course, looking at monthly users, but you know, it's really interesting. You can't, like you said, you can't look at averages. You have to look at those cohorts. So we've been getting a lot more focus on specific cohorts and identifying how users are using the application and grouping them together and then targeting them in specific ways because when you look at the average, you've got great growth, but in some of these different areas, you know, it's starting to slow down or it's negative, so we really need to change our product direction around the specific growth in specific cohorts. Cool. One area for Get Around that's kind of interesting is we launch in different areas. Uh, so different regions of the world and different cities in the U.S. right now. And you'll actually find that uh, the behavior of these different areas are completely different, right? Uh, D.C. gets snowed in and no one can use a car for a little while. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, we, we track tremendously well with the weather in San Francisco. A really bright sunny day does really well on Get Around. It's really interesting to dive yeah. into this stuff. Cool, that's great. Yeah, Yelp has some similar uh, kind of data in that uh, slicing by market is critical for us. International and domestic are very, very different. Um, we just noticed something recently. We saw um, you know, traffic dropped internationally last weekend, and we're trying to figure out why. It turns out Easter is even a much bigger holiday in Europe than it is in the U.S., so you have to kind of take into account those things. And new versus returning users, of course, is one of the key ways that, that we break our, our data down. And this kind of by um, activity level, right? So people that we've seen in the last, you know, one, seven, thirty, 
and, and kind of greater number of days than that. So kind of by levels of retention. Um, cool. And another thing. So you know, I think we're we're talking about marketing. I guess I'm I'm kind of equating marketing and and growth here a little bit. And you know, as we kind of joked about in the in the last discussion, you know, growth is is kind of the trendy thing to talk about right now. And so I think everyone is, you know, you you feel like you're kind of obligated to create like a growth team. But I, so I'm I'm curious for you guys. Do you have a team that calls themselves a growth a growth team, or is it is 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 working on kind of driving key metrics just something that's part of all the work that you guys are doing? Um, so since I do product marketing, I'm the growth team. You are the growth uh, team. For mobile nice. adoption. Um, but I think when we think of growth, it's really two different things, right? It's, you know, you think of the leaky bucket. It's putting water in it, but it's also stopping the holes. Um, so it's a combination of doing marketing and using intelligence to get users to download the application to begin with, and then really using our product teams and really studying what our users do to make sure we're delivering the features that can bring them back. I mean, one of our really key indicators that we're looking at is how many times per month people come into the application. I'm sure that's a common one for all of us, mm -hmm. not just now. It's, you know, how many times are you going in daily? And really trying to drive that up. Um, so the growth engine is critical, but stopping the leaky holes is equally as important. And we kind of oscillate based upon company priorities and our release cycles and what, marketing or what market opportunities we have based on is it more important to get new users to download the app or is it more important to make sure that the people who are in the app are happy and getting value and being more productive? So uh, I guess what Getaround has found over the last little while is, and Getaround's interesting because uh, we have a lot of teams that are non-technical, right? We have people who move cars around or install devices and uh, we have a piece of hardware we install into every car. Um, so there are a lot of teams that need a bunch of support and that, uh, you know, growth is, is one of these teams, right? Uh, just how we have back office teams that need technical uh, teams working on this stuff. What we found is rather than having a very hierarchical technical organization, kind of like the, the AJ was saying in the last conversation that uh, these teams that are kind of fully uh, contained, they can work on a particular problem, don't have to depend on other teams to get work done, you know, have the designers, have the, the PM that's dedicated to the team, have the stakeholders all kind of on one team uh, allows us to move pretty quickly and growth is, is one of that. Cool, that's great. Yeah, Yelp, we, we, ha we do have a proper growth team. One thing we found that before we and more clearly defined what the different segments of that growth team were. It was easy for growth to just kind of eat everything because, of course, well, yeah, we want to grow the product in every possible area. So, you know, we, we broke that growth team down to folks working on acquisition and retention, and that made it a little bit more clear, like, what they were, what they were after, and then other teams could focus on, on other metrics. Um, Greg, I want to come back to something that, that you said earlier because I thought that was interesting. You know, I think often when people hear growth, they think about optimi they, they hear optimization, right? So we should kind of tune the product in a certain way to drive key metric. And I think that's, that's great. Um, but I think what you talked about is there's this thing you do that can perhaps get you a lot more growth, which is taking a step back and figuring out, hey, what do we need to do? Like, where does the product need to go more, more broadly in order to, to make maybe bigger, bigger strides? So I guess for, for you guys, do you think about those as kind of separate exercises? Is there kind of an optimization mode? And then there's a, hey, like, what new features should we be adding? What bigger bets should we be going after? Are those kind of part of the same same team, same roadmap. Yeah, absolutely. I think you have to look at both of them, right? Because when you're prioritizing your roadmap, there's so many different things that you can look at. And going back to the cohorts, you know, all of our different features, you know, usually have one set of users that are more interested in, especially because we have, you know, our most common users are, you know, sales users or sales managers or just people inside your company who are collaborating. We actually found that, you know, we thought the app was a, a sales app. Primarily, right? That's how we marketed it. That's kind of our core value as a company is we help you sell, we help you connect to your customers. But what we've really found, you know, through doing a lot of data science and finding these cohorts is it's a collaboration app. So it's more, more people are using it to get in there and work with each other and work with their sales teams and work with their back office teams, work with their product managers. If I'm a sales rep on the road and I have a question about how it works, I can use the application to reach out to a product marketer or a product manager, get that question answered really quickly. So it's bringing all these people together. And so that changes two things, knowing that you know, it's a social and collaboration app, not necessarily a sales app. We need to build more features that are geared towards your non-typical sales user. And then as marketing, and we're trying to do new customer acquisition, we need to really make sure we're focusing on identifying these new unique use cases, which we weren't really picturing before. You know, it's not the, you know, it's not hitting the ball down in the middle of the fairway. It's the ones that are a little bit 
outside and really going after those there has unlocked this huge amount of potential for our application. And Elliot, how about you guys? Do you, you know, if you're trying to prioritize, hey, we're going to do this kind of optimization of the product versus, hey, let's do this other kind of bigger feature, how do you kind of compare those things for your yeah. team? Yeah, I mean, you have, to, you have to do both, right? You have to continue optimizing the product experience, your growth engine, and also do the sort of R&D efforts, the, the, the things that aren't incremental improvements, because that changes your business in a way that just, you know, takes a, a significant step forward. So I guess one thing I'll, I'll call out as important there is actually uh, the, the sorts of innovations that your engineering teams can directly jump in and do. Letting these guys kind of, you know, the, we, we try very hard to get everyone on GetAround to constantly use GetAround. We give all of our employees a bunch of credit and say, go out and use it. Go to Tahoe, right? Figure out the stuff and you'll find our engineers will come back and say, you know what, I couldn't find this particular type of car and I really want to be able to do that, right? I really like Mini Coopers and I can't find that easily on the app. Let's just add that. Right? And, and what we found is that you know, a lot of these sorts of interesting innovations, going back to you know, the product manager is not usually right, but you can experiment with a bunch of these things and the, the best ideas come from you know, everywhere. Cool, it's great. Um, you know, I think one place that there's some overlap between uh, kind of product marketing, doing customer research, um, that overlaps often with, with user research. And uh, you know, some, some folks go with the, um, you have a dedicated user research team or maybe you do some, some outside user research. Um, I'm curious maybe how, how you guys have used uh, user research of some type. What, what have you done and how maybe has that related to, to growth and how have you used that, that data to, to figure out what features what you should build? Yeah. Uh, so we do product market surveys to understand our customers on a fairly regular basis from the product perspective to understand kind of which areas we're not finding in the data that we need to look a little bit more into. Mm -hmm. And so that you'll find all sorts of things like people are really trying to find cars for a particular use case that we didn't think of. And you can't necessarily find that in data unless you really ask them about these things. Mm -hmm. I guess the other area that's, that's really interesting and a great segment for understanding our customer base is uh, we have a phone line that people call into all the time. It turns out you know, there are all sorts of things that can go wrong with a car and so you have to be able to answer the phone if something happens. Um, and we, we've taken that to the you know, entire extreme where a lot of our leadership team uh, has taken support shifts. So we answer phone calls you know, for five hour shifts a couple times a week. And uh, oh man, you get so much interesting user research done. They're giving you the data. You know? like you're going like, why can't your thing do this? And you have to answer them right away. It's so interesting. But uh, that, I mean, that's one way that we could directly uh, get feedback from our customers, which absolutely drives growth. Yeah, I mean, we do a lot of the same things. We have our product managers and our employees sit down and, and shadow a salesperson, you know, listen to the calls coming in. And then we also have the benefit, I mean, we have 18,000 employees around the world, so we can get a very large sample size of a very large company using the application. So we really encourage our employees to use it, and most of our employees are fairly competent in the application, so they know where we can push it, they know what else we can do, and these interesting use cases kind of bubble up. I mean, we built org charts on there. We built all these ideas that weren't like right out of the box or we hadn't thought of yet, an employee just raised their hand and says, why can't it do this? I mean, you're doing the same thing, having your, your guys, your employees use GetAround. I mean, we've seen a lot with that. Um, we also, you know, we listen to our customers a lot. We bring them in. We have our big user conferences and we do a lot of kind of customer advisory boards and just sitting down and listening to the way people use it, what they want to use it and what their problems are. And that's just on top of all the, the instrumentation. Our product teams have had a huge focus on instrumenting every different part of the application. Um, Salesforce is relatively complicated. You can you try and make it really simple, but it's a platform. You can, it's different for every customer in the room. If you guys have it at your businesses, every one of you is a little bit unique. So instrumenting it and kind of making that common denominator across all these unique businesses is a huge challenge. Um, so we've really focused a lot of effort on that because you have to take the qualitative with the quantitative, like we said before. Yeah, I think that's I think that's spot on. I think one of the things we've been saying a lot lately is, you know, you you have to have good instrumentation to understand what's happening in your product. But if you really want to understand why, you know, running experiments often can't answer that question. You know, you know one example we were looking at uh, bounce rate for people who come into our app for the first time, and it's just a hard metric to move. And so we you know, so you just ask the question, why why are people bouncing? And it, it's very difficult to kind of get at that just using data. Um, so I would say some of the the most significant gains that we've made in growth grew out of trying to answer that question with people. And 
you know, we've tried to take a pretty lean approach. I, don't, I think people get intimidated by user research, like you need a team or you got to do some very formal study. But we go down to the park or go down to the Starbucks and, you know, ask 10 people. And I think some of the best ideas we've ever, we've ever had have come out of that, you know, hour worth of effort, right? Versus, you know, trying to do 30 different experiments and kind of like triangulate what, what's happening in your app. So I yeah, think there's a really Sitting nice down with real in. people who are using it. Like we, I tell our product managers to go, go to our cafe and sit down there and just watch how people use right. it or ask them a question. You have a feature you want to test? Just go show it to 10 people. You'll get better qual or qualitative um, feedback than you could possibly get doing a formalized study or doing A-B testing and you're showing a bunch of mocks up. Like right. It's just so much easier to hear someone's visceral reaction when they see that screen or that feature or that interaction for the first time. Right. I think it's, it's, you know, it's something people say a lot too. It's they like punctuate their sentences with like, talk to your users. But I think very few people actually do it and do it with a cadence that makes it normal. You know, I think you just have to use it like once a week, just like put it on your calendar, just go talk to five people. And I think that's how you kind of get it done. Um, I think sometimes you can go too far in that direction though. I've, I've definitely seen in the past and just, uh, different cases where we, we, we try to build what the customer is asking for, not what the customer wants. Mm -hmm. You have to be very careful if you're talking to users all the time, not to get to the point of like, okay, uh, I mean, so uh, for instance, our owners are a very group, vocal group of people and they have all sorts of you know, passionate uh, asks about uh, you know, how the flexibility of our application works and stuff like that. And, how do you, and we, we, we cater directly to those needs, but we have to be very careful about, you know, do we just build out the thousand different features that they're asking for all simultaneously? It, definitely not, right. right? Then they cannot use any of them. <laughs> um, so it, you, you have to take all of that feedback, but actually not just do whatever they're telling you, but actually to think about it critically and come up with, you know, okay, how do we solve that problem? Ask about the problems, not the potential solutions that the customers can think of off the top of their heads. Cool. Well, so, so we're talking about growth, and we've got this awesome audience here. We'd probably be doing them a disservice if we didn't talk about some tactics, right? So uh, <laughs> let's talk about some things that, that we've all done recently uh, that have worked um, and that have made move to metric. Um, if you could phrase your answer in the form of a tweet, that would also be useful, I think, <laughs> for everybody. So good, good um, luck. Do we have a whiteboard and I can draw <laughs> that on, eggplant the words, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, One of the things that we've been doing recently is um, we built out a program we call Adoption Manager. And so what that is, is looking at the way people are using um, Salesforce and then when they are not using it. So if they don't come back month after month, trying to re-engage them. Um, so we're, you know, it's a blunt tool now, so if you're not using it for a month, we send you an email. And on Android, we can act, we're actually sending push notifications. We're starting to do that on iOS pretty soon. Um, so just a quick thing. Oh, we haven't seen you recently come back. Uh, but we're actually building out, you know, and it will come out later this year, more sophistication in that. So the last things you were doing on the desktop app part of the application, how can you replicate that on mobile? You were doing these things on desktop. Okay, adoption manager engage you back in. You know, you were looking at a dashboard or you know, measuring your sales team or measuring your service team or something on the desktop. Let me push you a notification on your desk on your mobile device that oh you could see that or oh there's been an update or you know oh oh Elliot sold some more and here's this notification you could swipe to see that so really trying to get people to interact in context that they know and they're familiar with because they know and use Salesforce on the desktop and we want to make sure that they know that all of that functionality and more is available on the mobile device kind of in context. Cool, great. How about you, Elliot? So. Uh, it's a few tweets in there, but I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I think um, one of the things that I'll point to is get around is uh, is a marketplace. There, there's a supply side and a demand side, and if you uh, target too much supply, your owners don't make any money, and if you target too much demand, you can't get a car because they're all taken already. Um, so interestingly, the uh, the supply and demand don't necessarily line up in terms of time. When you go into uh, the, the, the analytics of how people use GetAround, the summer hits, which is just about happening, and everyone gets out of school, uh, the sun comes out and everyone wants to go places, and our demand goes through the roof. Um, and this is the time in which everyone wants to rent a get-around car, and so what we do is we actually try and amplify that, right? This is a time in which everyone wants to rent, everyone wants to rent a car, so we'll try and figure out how everyone wants to rent a get-around car, how to get them to do that more, and kind of 
double down on the demand side when demand is hot and easy to get and cheap. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the, you, you look at all these different segments, target the particular useful things in a local geography, get around is a very hyper-local thing, target those users and say, hey, it's a really good day to go to Napa. Check out the weather, look outside, this is awesome, right? Um, and then the winter rolls around, um, and people all go back to school, and they rent a whole lot less. And this is a time in which cars sit around in parking garages all day long, and the other side starts to get really interesting. It's like, wow. I haven't seen my car in two weeks. <laughs> and reminding people that they haven't done that, they should probably make a little bit of money on the side and rent out their car when they're not using it becomes a much easier thing to do. So you can, you can target these things uh, for a particular market for a particular set of time and take advantage of this marketplace to kind of swing it back so by the time we get back to the summer, we have so much supply that we can you know, uh, service all of that demand that's coming in. And how are you doing most of that? Um most of that work, are you, is it email? Is it, how are you reaching out to those different Yeah, audiences? so we reach out to them in a bunch of different ways, email and uh, 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 a number of uh, kind of digital channels, like Facebook seems to be doing really well for us right now. Um, I think uh, the, the, the future of where we're going is more uh, kind of short, small messages about you know, new cars being added to the platform right now, just next to you. And, uh, that can be directly in the app and, and kind of the, the, the little types of information that just keep you engaged are the things that seem to be working right now. Cool, that's great. Yeah, I'll, I'll share one thing that Yelp worked on recently. So, um, you know, I think we spent a lot of time thinking about that first app experience and trying to reduce friction, getting people to be able to, to search and use the app as quickly as, as possible. So we decided, after a lot of work there, we said, hey, what if we add friction <laughs> instead? <laughs> Try that, so it's a brilliant idea. Um, so we tried adding, um, you know, it's kind of, kind of obvious, but some type of onboarding flow that was um, trying to educate people a little bit. And education is the wrong word, because that sounds boring. I think really what we're trying to do is get people to get excited about Yelp and why it was, it was valuable. So I don't know if you guys have seen this. It's, it's a great website. I think it's just useronboard.com. Um, they do, they do teardowns of different people's uh, onboarding experience. Just awesome. It goes really in depth. And so just look, looking at that and figuring out what things worked really well and just kind of what that experience should feel like. So tried a bunch of things and you know, just tried to make using Yelp feel more aspirational. I want to explore my city. And we tried things that were funny. We tried things that were more kind of more education centric. And it turned out like adding that friction, it turns out most people actually went through all of those screens. And the people who did ended up retaining a lot more. And we didn't, we didn't decrease kind of the, you know, the bounds, things like that. So it was one of the few cases I've seen where, you know, kind of adding that friction actually made people stick around longer. And the things that were kind of straightforward but kind of aspirational were the ones that ended up ended up winning the, the kind of onboarding contest yeah. that we had there. So that was cool. That was something that we did. Sure yeah, we, uh, we didn't, initially we didn't actually necessarily require someone to talk on the phone to a new person adding their car to the platform. We added a sales process, right, where we call up every single person, get to know them and tell them about the get around platform as part of, <laughs> and that helped tremendously. Cool. Kind of in a similar yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, so Ella, you mentioned email a little bit and push notifications. I guess um, I can talk a little bit about how how Yelp's used those. But and Greg, I'm curious from you. You know, is there a, something that you've done with with push or text that has has helped your your product or, or email? Yeah. So, I mean, we're definitely doing push and tech or excuse me, push and email for um, trying to get users to come back to the application. But we've been really looking at um, push for relevant topical things. So. Um, when you get a notification inside of Salesforce, it pushes out to your phone, pushes out to your watch, that kind of thing. Or you know, we're getting to the point where you can actually take action from the notifications as well. Um, it's a really big step forward from us to, you know, for us, approvals is a really big thing. Um, built inside of our platform for every different use case, you know, we have approvals in there. If it's a product manager moving a, you know, a product forward or a salesperson moving a deal forward. And so now we're pushing, using push to actually push that out use that word twice in one sentence, um, <laughs> but put, get the notification to a watch or to a phone so now I can just swipe and take action of it and really reduce the friction. Because if you, you know, email's great, email's not going away, but you know, we, you know, a couple years ago we do the approval emails and I could just click reply and write yes and hit send and that magically it did the approval. And so it was a huge step forward. But now, I mean, users, especially on mobile, they're getting lazy, they want it faster, they want it easier, they don't want to have to go into the email notification. 
Um, so using push to actually take those actions is a very big step forward. Cool, great. Yeah, it's, really, it's, it's a really tricky one too, right? I mean, push, I think all of us try to use it as mindfully as possible, or at least we should, Definitely. right? Yeah. So I think one of the things that you know, we've tried, we send out, um, we have kind of like a weekly newsletter, kind of explore your city, and uh, we tried just sending out a push, just letting people know that we had that. And you know, one thing we were experimenting with is what is the right uh, kind of call to action there, right? And I don't know about you guys, but that you get some push notifications that um, it just sounds like a very excited teenager wrote them. There's a lot of exclamation <laughs> points, and they're like hyping you up, and those don't tend not to work very well. So what we found is that the uh, well, well, two learnings. One, the, the, the more straightforward the copy on your push notification, the better, mm -hmm. right? The more it just sounds like a very simple um, but actionable notification, uh, the better. So anytime you, anytime you find yourself trying to write like clever marketing copy, you're probably doing the wrong thing. Um, also, and I was actually disappointed to learn this, when we included just a single emoji in the push notification, uh, conversion increased dramatically, which is just <laughs> maybe the worst learning that you could, <laughs> you could ever get. So I expect now to be receiving, you know, horse heads and winky faces from all of you uh, and all of your <laughs> products going forward, but it turns out it works. Um, so maybe this last question for all of us here, you know, I think one thing that uh, we've talked about at, at Manifesto is we talk about growth and it feels kind of cold and analytical, but obviously there's a more sort of artistic and emotional side to growth too, or not even growth, you're just kind of making your product better. So maybe if you have an example of something you've done in your product that really wasn't about, hey, we're going to like, we got to move user acquisition. So this just makes the product better. Um, let me, you know, talk about one, one example you've had there. Okay. Mm, I have to think about this one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, just on the pure marketing side, one of the things we found is that the, one of the best ways that people learn about Get Around is we have a, a purple sign which uh, is where all of our get-around cars are parked, right? The, the parking is a dedicated parking spot for get-around, and there's a little purple sign on there. And, like, that is an incredibly useful product experience tool, right? You, you, you really do need to find these cars, and the more visible these things are, and the, the, the more people go, oh, what is that thing? Mm -hmm. I keep seeing that all over the city. Um, uh, you know, the, the more it drives engagement, and the more people start hearing about the product. So this was one of those, like, well, we've, we've got to put up a sign so that people know where to park. Let's make that a little bit interesting, right? Let's, let's make that stand out. And that, that turned out to be a huge driver for growth. Cool, that's great. Um, for us, you know, we, we listen to our users, I think, for part of this. So, you know, we, Salesforce had this app and we had this mentality as, you know, pushing the mobile out that, you know, business users should be inside of Salesforce. They should be inside of Salesforce One. You know, they're gonna get away from email. They're gonna collaborate inside of Salesforce in the context. You know, we had all this marketing messaging, built all these products around that. But then we realized like, email's not going away. No matter how much you say that or read that or hear the analysts, it's, it's not going anywhere. It's, you know, it's the way you communicate, right? And so we've embraced that and we've actually come out with a new inbox product that puts Salesforce and CRM data inside of your inbox on your phone. So now I look at an email, I can look up your profile, I can send you emails, we actually built this really easy to use, but I thought it was so simple that no one would use it, but it's been amazing. It's just a scheduler. It says, okay, we need to have a, a conference call. It looks at my calendar on my iOS device, pushes out my availability, and when you look at it, you know, when the recipient looks at it, it automatically updates the time, they click on one, meeting's booked. Mm -hmm. So it's a really, really simple process that's solving a horrible problem of scheduling a meeting when you're on your phone, and just adding in these little user features that you know, it's not solving the world, it's not helping you close deals, it's not like this big aspirational run your business from your phone, it's like a very, very small tactical thing, but our users love it. And we're seeing a lot of growth by just really listening to them and kind of solving problems that are problems, but they're not like really sexy problems, I would right. say. Cool, I think that's great. Yeah, one of the things that we've tried to do is just always set aside some engineering space for things that are going to be fun. So we have like mm. a fun objective, which I realize sounds like not fun at all. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, as I think there's, Making your making your audience smile. I can't I can't prove that that's going to move any like one metric, but I think we all probably believe that it actually does. One thing we did a little a while back um, was now you're all going to think that all we care about Yelp is emoji, but we allowed people <laughs> to to search by emojis. So you could do this right now if you use the pizza emoji in the Yelp app. It will actually search for pizza. Um, this did not move any key metric for us at all, uh, but it was fun and it made you guys laugh. Makes me laugh. So you know I think just doing things like that they're they're, they're good for the product, they, they show your audience that you, that you care about them and that you're, you're trying to have a good time. So 
think those things are always always valuable. Yeah, um, April Fool's Day is when. April Fool's Day, the the <laughs> worst day on the internet. Um, <laughs> so just everybody, just just call in sick tomorrow. <laughs> uh, cool. Well, thanks for talking, guys. And uh, yeah, 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 thank you. Thank you. Cheers.